In this game called basketball, there's really no assured blueprint to acquiring one of the 400 plus jobs in the NBA. And even if you do, being special enough or have played the right cards timely enough to stick around and make that a career. The question everyone always wants to know about the guys they expected to, could have or would have made it had this or that not happened is what happened to them. They ask it sorrily, as if said player died or resulted to shining boots in Vegas. There's so many avenues to be successful in this huge world, and sometimes being a high-level basketball player like this guy has been opens even bigger doors than an NBA check ever could. Today's feature, George Daniel Ewing Jr., born March 26, 1983. He was one of the guys I watched closely throughout his time at Duke, and although I wasn't his biggest fan towards the end, I enjoyed watching him and too had bigger expectations for him being as naturally gifted as he was. Daniel, in my opinion, wasn't dealt the best hands, but also chose those hands and the cards he played. Why didn't he last in the NBA? Here's why. Visit StunnerGrow3.com on sale for a limited time now. It's your boy JC Stunner Grow. Let's get it. Stunt number one, to launch big ships, go where the water is deep. And that's exactly what Daniel Ewing chose to do. But in hindsight, it was the wrong choice. Duke University is still at the top of the mountain as far as prestige and perception. They've always had a strong recruiting class and received every team's best competition night in and night out. In 2001, it was no different. Daniel Ewing was a high school star in the backcourt with another former NBA player TJ Ford and McDonald's All-American by his senior year. He was recruited by a lot of the top programs including Kansas and Kentucky. He was a sure thing for Kansas and actually scheduled a visit with Roy Williams. Depending on how that went, he could have been a Jayhawk. Then there was Kentucky, the school that's recruited him since a freshman in high school. And because he waited too long, Tubby Smith went with a different recruit. The reason he didn't attend Kansas is because Coach K called him personally two days after scheduling his visit there and made him an offer. He took the offer right over the phone and the deal was done. You can never discredit a person for securing that type of academic education and high-level basketball experience, but for him, he could have definitely had more success choosing a different school. Every year he's been at Duke, he's had at least four or five other NBA players on the roster with him. In that situation, he wasn't able to produce like teammates with less talent did. Freshman year, he had one of my favorite college point guards ever in Jason Williams. Also Dante Jones and Mike Dunleavy, who were all top 20 if not lottery picks, along with Duhan and Boozer. He averaged six points per game off the bench. As a sophomore, JJ Reddick came into the picture and totally became the face of the franchise. He and Sheldon Williams came in and hit the ground running. Reddick was in his position and shot the ball like no other at the time, Steph Curry in college. Ewing would never see a year where he was in position to perform and show teams his full package. Maybe Kentucky or Kansas were better fits. In my opinion, they were. Stunt number two, doom from the start. Daniel Ewing was maybe the poster child for the word tweener or the phrase out of position. The reason why is because he never had a choice. Throughout high school, his backcourt mate every year was TJ Ford, one of the best at his position at the time and in college. Therefore, Daniel being a little taller had to play off the ball. He went to Duke and for his first three years was in the same position with Jason Williams and Chris Duhon. Because he always had a great point guard next to him, he never really got to show that he could play the position consistently and be impactful doing it. He averaged 12 points a game in both his second and third years at Duke. On top of that, he didn't assist well or rebound well enough to show his potential to affect the game in a different way. In his senior year, he did play the point and it just wasn't enough time. He never really looked the part of point guard to where he could break down a guy and finish at the rim or make a play for a teammate consistently enough. A solid player, but obviously not a point guard and you can't blame him. He played the position fully just one year and at 21, 22 years old. Stunt number three, develop too late. 
It's as simple as that. Daniel went on to become a solid player in his senior season, averaging 15 points and 4 assists. But like mentioned, he was clearly in the wrong position. And in that position, he wasn't dominant enough. And even on his own team, he wasn't the best in the position. His teams in four years were always very talented, but failed to win the championship in that time. Between that and his skills not in the position NBA teams saw him in, he slipped to the second round of the draft, being selected by the Clippers with the 32nd pick. In two years with the Clippers, Daniel didn't get the opportunities he needed to further develop the only position he could play in the league and be successful. At the time, the D-League was around, but not as developed as it needed to be to give young Ewing a chance to develop his point guard skills. Had it been, he'd probably stay in the States and close to the league while showing them he could slide over to the one. Because the D-League developed too late, he accepted a deal overseas, and while lucrative, put him out of their eyes and an afterthought. But the actual reason I said develop too late was not the D-League, it was Daniel Ewing's skills. If you watch his highlights overseas, this guy looks like an NBA player, and not one of those that only looks good against the competition. No, he looked like he finally put it all together. He had a long career in Europe, but moved around a lot due to teams looking for a different type of player. He wouldn't get another shot at the league, but has been a solid player in college and post-NBA. Is he Cam Reddish, a guy with gobs of talent, but without the dog to show it? I don't think so. I just think he had some unfortunate development issues that may have gotten by at a different school where he could show his skills and acquire a first round contract, giving him more opportunities. But salute to him. I enjoyed your story and I'm sure you're doing great things out there. It's your boy JC, Stunted Growth, and I'm out.